Hi, everyone. Welcome. Let's get started. I'm Sarah Hanawal, Assistant Head of School for Professional Development here at One Schoolhouse. Um, we're just getting started. I see folks coming in from the waiting room, so I just want to share that my guest today is Lori Palco, and Lori has a long history with independent schools and One Schoolhouse, so I'm super excited that she's here with us today. And we've promised to save some time for Q&A because we've got questions that have already come in if you saw my message on the listserv. So Lori, you want to say hi to everyone and then I'll do some slides and get us going? Sure. Hi, everyone. It's good to be with you today. And as Sarah said, I, I, I was thinking about this. I've been associated with independent schools now for 20 years. So um, seven in the classroom and then in um, leadership positions. So it's great to be with everyone. Great. That includes some time at one schoolhouse too, doesn't it? Yes, uh, seven years. Oh, that's great. Um, so as I as is my want, I've got a few slides to get us started. And in this time, I think you'll see that there is something really um, a couple of things in here that I want to draw your attention to. We're going to talk about leadership opportunities and the next normal. This is our series on what is the next normal. And then We've also got something on our blog that I want to direct everyone's attention to, which is 10 years of extraordinary leadership by our head of school, Brad Rathgever, who celebrated an anniversary with us. So um, check that out, if you will. Next week's webinar is going to be an interesting one. It's a nice follow up to this, actually. It's a study that's been done on personality traits and leadership style. Mm -hmm. And my guest will be Jamie Estes from Southern Teachers, who is one of the authors of that research. So Lori, I would be remiss if I didn't say that you are the designer, not just the facilitator for building trust with faculty, critical skills for academic leaders. And some of what we're going to talk about today is what you've gleaned from teaching that course over the past year. Speaking of what we've gleaned, I'm going to tell you that Lori and I planned this webinar a little while ago, and here is this week's Pulse question. And I've got some responses that just came in this morning. So we asked folks, what leadership traits are most essential at this particular moment in schools? And the results were kind of dramatic, the traits that people identified as absolutely their number one. So if you look at communicative and empathetic, those two are traits that Lori identified with me in planning this webinar before we'd even asked this question in the pulse. So, and then there's a third that's kind of a dark horse and a ringer. So we'll talk about that too in a little bit. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I'm going to drop in the chat the link to take the pulse survey if you want to uh, contribute your, your thoughts. And then Laura, you and I are going to dive into this just a little bit more as we go. But so when we were planning, you made a really interesting observation. Can you share that here? Because I think it will resonate with our participants. Sure, you were, you were talking about the Pulse survey and what leadership skills do academic leaders need to grow and develop as, as they move um, into the next normal, as you said it. And when I looked at that list, the first thing that came to mind, and I've said this before, is it reminds me of the list of skills that we're trying to build in our students. And I think there's a recognition that we as leaders need to have some of those same skills that we're teaching our students. I could not agree more. And I think that was interesting. You and I talked about, you know, how that's a, something that's changed in schools um, when we think about those traits. So, I think if you think about, you know, most schools and their picture of the graduate exercises, you would find that similar list again. And so I want to go back to that dark horse one, because that's the one we're going to start with. All right. So we picked um, one that wasn't a top choice, and that was collaboration. Can you talk about that a little bit more? Yeah, and I think, and I think it includes some of the other ones that, <clears throat> excuse me, are on there. Um, we've had to over the past 15 months with everything that academic leaders have been facing, that we've, we've had to bring people together, we've had to be decisive, and we've had to come up with solutions in the, you know, in the midst of this incredible pandemic and all the issues that schools are facing. But I think overall, what I have found in dealing with leaders 
is that collaboration and facilitating authentic collaboration is not a skill that, that leaders really um, know how to do very well because leaders are conditioned to think that they have to have the answers and that they have to come up with the solutions and fix problems for other people. So it's not our natural tendency to first think about how can I structure collaboration to come up with solutions that um, you know, advance the mission and embody what we're trying to do. They think they have to have the answers. Right. So if we're conditioned to think, okay, I've got the answer in my back pocket and I'm here, I'm gonna solve your problems. How do academic leaders make that shift to elevate their thinking and really expand? Because if you've always got the answer in your back pocket, then that's also, there's only one person contributing to that answer. Yeah, and I, I think it is a mindset shift that <clears throat> their role is not to have all the answers, but to facilitate the solutions. And it really is going to take an investment of time and an investment in structures to, to have systems and structures and meetings and processes to authentically collaborate with colleagues and, and faculty. And you know, just think about, think about project learning at, at school for students. You really have to be intentional and you really have to have a process that people know their roles and that there's intended outcomes and that there's skills that you're trying to teach as part of that as well. Same thing applies for collaboration. So I, that's really interesting. So I'm thinking back to when I used to do projects with middle schoolers and we would actually, like a chair would be designated. If you're sitting in this chair, your role is to. Right. And then we would say, okay, everybody move one seat to the left. Now your role has changed. Like we were teaching how to work together in that way. How can we do that in a, in a obviously different sort of way? We're not gonna color code the chairs in our meetings probably, but what should we be doing? Well, I think first is to really devote the time and, and the intention that, that you want to build collaboration within your community to solve problems, to advance issues, to initiate change, whatever, whatever you're trying to accomplish. The mindset first has to be that, that we want to do this in a collaborative way. And so I think as a leader, you have to lean into being willing to learn, um, to challenge your own beliefs. I often say this a lot of times, and I know this has happened, you come into a meeting and you walk out and you say, well, they already knew what the answer they wanted. And this was just to, to tell us. So I think you have to let go of being attached to a specific outcome. Yet you have to give the structure of the outcome that's needed and why it's needed as well. Like, why are we here? What's our intention? What's the process? What's the timeline? What are we trying to accomplish? And I don't think that just comes naturally because we schedule all these meetings and the last thing we think we have is more time to actually put structure around facilitating meetings. Yeah, so, so we need to be a little bit more, um, <laughs> a little bit more like Prince, dearly beloved, we are gathered here too. And then you used out the term outcomes. And I think Kareem Dadini has a really nice way of describing outcomes, which is that not the decision is made, but our outcome is in this situation, what is best for this group of, let's say you've got a, a trip that has to be canceled. What is going to be the best way to serve this group of students since we have to make a change? And when we define our outcomes that way, then we're encouraging collaboration, I think. Yeah, we're, we're defining the, the purpose. And I think when we can tie that purpose to a, a, a bigger purpose, um, uh, you know, under our mission or student experience or faculty experience or you know, what we're trying to do with, with families, whatever it is, if we can frame it in that way, then I think it, it opens up people's thinking. So the structures need to create a safe environment 
where people really feel their ideas are, are not only um, welcome, but they're valued and diverse thinking is valued. And so we build upon solutions under that purpose. So we come up with an outcome that truly fits that purpose. That, yeah. That's great. I just want to remind everybody, if you've got questions for Lori, go ahead and put them in the Q&A. We've got one already that I know we'll want to answer. Um, can I say one more thing about... about um, yes, you can. You're the guest. You can say... <laughs> about collaboration, because it was it, there were some other traits on there, and I think it all ties together, okay? Um, and it's collaboration, consensus building, being decisive, and accountability. When we do collaboration really well, it is, it is the best opportunity for consensus building within a team, within a department, within a division, within a school, because everyone was at the table, had a chance to be heard, you know, their voice and the solution that came up, that we come up with for that outcome was a solution that was a broader, um, with more possibility. So I think when, when we do it well, we build consensus, we can be more decisive, and we, we build shared responsibility and accountability for taking whatever that, that change or innovation or decision or problem um, out into you know, executing uh, upon that everyone feels like they were a part of it. So they are part of the solution, they're part of the communication. They feel like they're bigger than just maybe some part of the little part of the school that they're in. They have that shared accountability. And I think that's really important. Yeah, and there's, there's another aspect of that that I wanna bring up later too, that shared component. But okay. um, when you and I were talking, we were talking about structured and investing time in the area of communication as well. So we've got collaboration, but when we talk about effective leaders, they don't just collaborate differently, they also communicate differently. And I think that that's gonna to touch on Allison's question in the Q&A, but not enough, I'm not, Allison, this isn't your answer. I'm just letting you know that I'm in, I've seen it. Can you talk a little bit about communication? Yeah, and I, it's interesting in working with schools over the last 15 months, they're like, oh my God, we're so much communication. Like we're, we're over communicating. And, and we needed to, and a lot of times um, we think of communications about, it's about doing school and about the logistics of doing school and the operations of it. Um, and so often in terms of when decisions are made or, you know, um, there's a change in schedule or curriculum or, or decisions are made around resources. We don't tend to communicate as much um, in that area around the, the why, the how, and the what. Why did, why did we do what we did? Um, how was the decision made? Um, what are the details of the decision? And I often say this, just like learners have different styles, everyone has different communication needs. Okay, so some people need to know the big picture. I need to know the big picture first. Other people just tell me what to do. What are the details? What's, how's it impacting me? And others need to know how the decision was made. So I think from a communication standpoint, I, I think it's um, understanding, and I love this quote, and I shared this with you, this George Bernard Shaw quote, and it says the single biggest problem in, com in communication is the illusion that it has taken place. <laughs> so it's about understanding the different communication needs of, of your constituents as well. Yeah, and I think um, that actually relates to another one of our traits. So what you're really asking leaders to do is to anticipate and meet the needs of constituents and and sometimes leaders want to do all of that at once, and it results in a really long, long email that doesn't, that then doesn't meet the needs of some of the folks who are like, I need the bullet points. Um, so you've really got to draw on your empathy and think about your communication a little bit differently. And, and before I get you to talk about empathy, I just, you said something else that I don't want to draw on. You yeah. talked about saying, when people say my door is always open, 
Well, that is not necessarily the best thing to say. It can be helpful, but what else is, you know, and I'm going to quote you to yourself. I'm sorry. Cause yeah, that's right. Uh, I, I think I know what you, what you are getting at. Um, I often hear when I'm, when I'm coaching and working with leaders, they say, well, you know, why didn't you come tell me? Or my door is, is always open. And, you know, I, I think it's really incumbent on leaders um, now and always um, to be present and to be visible. You know, guess what? Other office doors are always open and other and classrooms are open to get out and be present with the community as well. So don't always put the responsibility for understanding what is going on and being present to someone else, okay? I think it's really important to, to get out, be present, listen, um, and don't put it all on someone else that you, you should have come to me. Right, and, and I think that actually leads to the empathy question as well too. Um, can you talk a little bit about empathy as a leadership skill, not a kindness trait? Yeah. Um, you know, a lot of times when um, act leaders, and not just academic leaders, but leaders in general, they think they're being helpful if they're they're being kind or they're they're giving advice about what to do. When when we talk about empathy, I go to immediately seeking first to understand, which we hear in schools. So how do, I, how do I seek first to understand what somebody or someone else or a group of people are, are feeling or what they are dealing with? So to me, we can't show up with empathy if we're not curious and seeking first to understand and make it about the other person. It's in this case, we, we need to make sure that our intention is about understanding what is going on with somebody else. How many times, Sarah, have you said, someone's talking, you said, oh yeah, that happened to me. You know, right away it becomes about me, not about the person in front of me. Right, so I'm not creating a bond by identifying what I'm doing is saying, even though you're talking about yourself, I'm already thinking about me. Yeah. Yeah. You taught me that earlier and it's something that it's helpful with teenagers certainly. It's helpful, it is helpful to parent, yes. I have a couple of local teenagers, um, hyper local. So what can leaders do if they want to increase their empathy, if they suspect that maybe they haven't been as empathetic as they want to be and they're headed into a year and something that we talked about last week, if I can interrupt myself here, we talked a little bit about how resilience is going to be something that we're going to need to draw on next year. Resilience isn't necessarily in the middle of a crisis or a problem, but it's how we respond afterwards. And so next year is going to be when some folks are going to struggle with their resilience. So given that, what are specific strategies that you can recommend as um, empathy weightlifting or empathy building? <laughs> empathy building. Um, I think the first one that, that I would say is learning to take care of self. Empathy has to start with self. Um, I, it is certainly understandable that, that leaders in schools, as everyone in education, is feeling very depleted coming off the last 15 months. Um, but what I have found is that in, in some schools, there's almost a constant state of, of overwhelm with academic leaders and leaders in schools. So you can't show up <clears throat> as your best self if you're not practicing self-care. You can't give to others and really be curious and seek to understand what is going on with them if you feel totally depleted yourself. So we talk about, we talk about self-care, we talk about wellness in schools and mindfulness now in schools, we really need to start as leaders with that for ourselves. Because that is the only way that we can then really move to being there as our best self for the people that, that are working with us and for us. 
So I think it is really learning how to create distractions, to ask for help, um, to get away from it, and to also model what we're saying to others. I've often said to, to leaders, I said, you know, you, you want to talk about healthy boundaries and wellness and having balance in your life. And yet, you know, you're sending emails and texts at eight o'clock, 10 o'clock at night. Um, that's not practicing self-care. And I don't think it's modeling what you want to instill in others. So it, it does start with self. And it's that, um, use that scheduled send if you really are having to do it at that time maybe because you needed to use that scheduled send so somebody else sees it at 8 a.m which is when they should oh, right so they don't feel they need to to respond or react to it and i think the other thing that um the last 15 months has probably shown a light on is how we can't show up with empathy if we're not aware of our own unconscious biases and beliefs. So that gets in the way of really understanding where someone else may be coming from. Mm -hmm. So I think not only self-care, but self-awareness. Um, think about the issues that the schools have had to, to face and, and are going to continue to face around social and racial injustice and issues. Um, all the DEI work that's going on in schools. It, it, it will be incumbent on leaders to really pay attention and become self-aware about their own biases and beliefs and being open to examining those so you can show up with empathy and, and be gentle with yourself. It's, it's, not, it's not something you've done wrong, but that self-awareness will help you get at where, where are you triggered? Where do you have beliefs that maybe you need to examine? And Sarah, you know, one of the things that I, that I talk about in the course, um, the Building Trust course is, is really developing your listening skills mm -hmm. um, because we can't show up with empathy if we're listening from a me focus. I talk about three levels of listening. Right a me focus, an other focus, and a more global focus. And when we're in the me focus, we're, we're thinking about our thoughts and feelings or, or the judgments are going on in our head. And it's, it's difficult then to show up with empathy for what the other person is. So we build that change, with, we build that empathy muscle by being self-aware and really getting the focus back on the other person from a listening standpoint and being curious and asking questions and following their lead so we can understand. They can grow by having to talk more and we can grow from listening and understanding. So I think self-care and self-awareness where our own biases and beliefs get in the way of showing up with empathy. Yeah, and those, the first one of those is something that has been talked about a lot, but sometimes we talk about and don't do. Um, so I'll acknowledge that. And then I think the self-awareness piece, it is super easy to make that something that I'm going to get to as soon as I insert problem of the moment that you need to solve because that, that time for reflecting on where am I short in my empathy is, um, that's not necessarily a fun exercise. I know that when we've done work like that before, uh, it's uncomfortable and it's okay to be uncomfortable as you grow there. Yeah, it is It is um, very sometimes hard and intentional work because it brings up stuff that maybe you haven't wanted to look at. But if, if we wanna, if, if the two things I said were self-care and self-awareness, we can't show up as our best self without either of those. We can't give if we're depleted. We have to learn how to take care of self. Otherwise, we're not showing up as the best self for the ones we're leading. And that is going to require a level of self-awareness that will challenge all of us to grow. Right. So I wanna 
ask the question that came from the course, and then we've got a couple in the Q&A that I want to make sure we get to. So I'm going to switch us over to Q&A mode, and if you will, put your questions in the Q&A. But here's the, the question that came from the course, which is how do I shift the narrative away from stressed out and venting? And we're not talking about burnout, but just when the conversation seemed to be stuck at that level among the community where people are saying, yes, I'm so exhausted too. And oh my gosh, there's something else to do. And, and the conversation just seems like a, a ping pong of that. Yeah. Yeah, you can go down that almost, oh, it's overwhelming and poor me. It's that, it's that expression of being depleted, right? Mm -hmm. So to me, it's, it's um, I employ a coaching model in working with, with individuals and that's built around active listening asking questions facilitating action and inviting accountability so it's similar it's a skill to facilitate the conversation that yes listen um, but then ask questions right. what could you what could you do to better take care of yourself what could you do to not feel as stressed out? How could, can I specifically help you? What are some actions you can take? How do we, you know, ask some of those powerful questions to shift the narrative from, oh, poor me, this is hard, to you know, just saying we do it with students. You know, we don't let students stay stuck in I can't do this, or it's too hard, or poor me. We as teachers and educators know that our responsibility is to move them beyond that into they come up with solutions and they have, um, they own the action and feel accountable and have agency for that. Same thing with dealing with adults. Ask the questions, move them beyond where they are. Meet them where they are, love them where they are, but move them beyond it. <laughs> hey. And, um, and accountability for me is a little bit, I think the first time we talked about accountability, I sort of went, I know. I love that word, because to me, I think about things like having third graders be accountable for a standardized test score, and that gets my back up. But you're using that term really differently. And I think that's, that's just worth pointing out that that's the accountability that goes with the agency. Like if something is mine and I own it, then I'm accountable to myself. Yeah, it's more personal responsibility um, that I am accountable to myself and therefore to others. Yeah, I think that's super important. So Bill asks a great question. Um, sometimes faculty members seem to seek and desire a more hierarchical leadership system. How can leaders work with them to facilitate a more collaborative mindset? So this is the person who sits in the back of the meeting with the arms crossed and says, just tell me what to do. Yeah. Yeah, I think... I think a collaborative um, mindset and a collaborative process can still work within the hierarchy of, of the, uh, the school. So a, a leader, again, their job is to, is to set the structure. You know what you're trying to accomplish in terms of, of what the issue is. You know how it aligns with, with mission. So you provide the structure to come up with the solution. You don't have all the answers. So I, I think the leader and the person higher in the, in the um, hierarchy has that responsibility to build then the personal responsibility that people are part of the solution. Because a lot of times people say they just want to be told what to do, but in, in essence, they, a lot of times they don't. But it's a mindset shift that collaborative solutions still, who's coming up with what we're working on and what are some of the ideas? First and foremost, a lot of times that is the leadership, but how that's accomplished and what the specific outcome, that's a, better with collaborative solutions in my mind. Right, and I think that goes back to that structure that I was joking about the co different colored chairs, but yes. Right. So when you provide the structure for the collaboration rather than just an open ended, what does everybody think you're going to get more? You have a re you have a really important role as the leader in setting those structures to set up, you know, authentic collaboration. Right. Right. So Allison's got a question here at the end that I think is a webinar 
in and of itself, or maybe a course, um, but I want us to, to think about this a little bit, which she says, for female leaders, I worry that not having the answers can be perceived as a sign of weakness or insecurity. Can you address the gender component of that, this mind shift, mindset shift a little bit? Yeah, I, I could not agree with you more that it's something that leaders struggle with, female leaders. And I would say, um, since my background coming up was in, in finances, it's, it's really uh, magnified there for female leaders. I, I think what I say is trust your intention, trust, um, trust the process, hold the vision, and understand that it, um, if, if your intention is pure and you're coming up from a place of, of trying to facilitate um, the best answers, again, back to collaboration a little bit, and, you, and you're very communicative, then I think you can trust in that. You really can trust in your intention and your purpose, which I think female leaders do really well in terms of framing why we're doing something. Trust in that. And um, no one has all the answers. And I think the last 15 months showed us that, that we all need each other. Um, so trust in your, your intention and your, um, your purpose. Well, thank you. We ran a little bit over, but I think um, that was definitely worth it. Thank you, everybody, for coming today. And thank you, Lori. Thank you, everyone.